Now for a session on the vision and the challenge, please welcome State Representative Kristen Boggs and Tess Elshoff, President of the Ohio State Board of Education. Back to lead the discussion is the Atlantic Steve Clemens. Hey everybody, drinks are soon. Yes, Tess, I want you there. I, it, we, we, ran. we were going to put you guys together, but like, you're president of the Ohio State Board of Education, right? You're like, Correct. You're like the big cheese. No. And you're, 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 a, you're appointed by Governor Kasich. You're a Republican, right? Correct. So you are a former deputy attorney general for the state, representative of the 18th district, and I think you're a Democrat, right? I am a Democrat. So these two people I'm, I'm predicting in 18 years will be running against each other in the, for the United States Senate. So, so um, I don't want to make it too kind of, you know, warm and fuzzy right now. So I'm going to sit in the middle. I'm, I'm frustrating my team. But thank you for joining. Let me just start out and go to Madam President and ask, you know, what, oftentimes, you know, we're talking about tech and ed and we're talking about the ecosystem for education, how to make outcomes healthier, better, to link resources to need uh, and to deal with life. If, if we were to make you all powerful in the state to kind of figure out where you're going to disrupt the system, what would you do? As far as what technology would look like in each and every district? No, just making it, you know, it, maybe, maybe technology is not the issue. Tell me if you were going to be a disruptor, an innovator and disruptor, and you had real power to change the Ohio educational system, what would be your priorities? Um, to uh, allow districts to be able to uh, serve each and every student to the needs of each and every student's um, abilities to reach their full potential. What does that mean? <laughs> um, every student, um, I firmly believe, um, is different. They learn different, they achieve different, they have different needs. Um, and, and I think so often we put everyone in the same um, silo, the same box to go forward, and it doesn't allow each one of the students in Ohio to reach their full potential. Madam Representative, you get the power now, and so how would you disrupt? What would be your answer to kind of disrupting the network? Or do you feel that the, that the uh, educational ecosystem of Ohio needs to be disrupted? Um, if, if I were to do one thing that would disrupt the ecosystem of our education in Ohio, um, radical idea, I think that I would probably uh, take school funding out of, out of the hands of the state legislature and put it into the power of another body that isn't stifled by voters and who the governor is and term limits and create a real strategic plan to long-term funding education. Now you come from an area of a state, I understand, it's three hours south from here, right? Three hours north. Three hours north, excuse me and is one of the, the, the more resource-strapped areas of the state. That so you came right. from sort of a poor base in, in the school system, and now you're representing some of the richest kids in the state, right? Yeah. How does that feel? Uh, well, I'm, I'm proud of the school districts that I get to represent that are, that are ranked um, some of the highest in the country, but certainly I understand the challenges mm -hmm. of coming from a school district that is strapped for resources and has the issues that are typical of our rural communities. Mm -hmm. Tess, you're in one of these, you're in New Knoxville, right? Which is, Correct. and you have five children, as I understand it, that, that are yeah. in, this, in this area. Um, and, and you are in one of the areas where it's been sort of tougher from a resource base. Yes, it, it's one of the smallest school districts in the state of Ohio. So how do you bridge that gap between resources and opportunity? I mean, I know that, that, that Governor Kasich, when he invited you to, to play this role, was taken with the fact that you're coming from uh, a school system that is rural, that was there. So I'm interested in, in, in you know, you, I mean, you two may actually be on the same page, I think, on this, which would be remarkable, right? So, um, but how, how, how? So that means we get to move seats, right? What's that? Yeah, we yeah, we can get people both together. That might be better, in fact. We'll, we'll get there in a minute, but let's prove it first. But how would you, how would you deal with this issue of bridging the gap between, you know, a more cash-strapped rural district with, with opportunity kind of, in your role, because you've got to worry about the entire state, right? Correct. Um, I think uh, utilizing different resources, one being the Department of Education to, to t step up and be a key role um, with districts in allowing um, them to be a network of um, different grant opportunities that are out there, partnerships, um, collaborations, not only within our state, but uh, nationwide that are out there helping utilize technology and getting it into the classroom. How is, is technology um, seen as, as a 
uh, a deliverer, a, a platform for opportunities within, with say, New Knoxville? Um, currently at New Knoxville, they are not a one-to-one -one school. Um, technology is integrated within um, all of the classes, but it's not heavily utilized. Um, but there are other rural districts across the state that, that are on a one-to-one -one and, and use it continuously throughout their day. Is that a problem that it's not as incorporated in, and developed from your perspective? Um, no, I think it needs to be um, kind of guided. I, I think all school districts need to give a baseline uh, mm. of um, exposure and fundamentals to it, but then they also need to be very aware and respectful of the community that they're um, around and what the needs for those communities are. Some communities may not uh, emphasize as much more on technology. They may emphasize um, a stronger um, focus on something else, and so I think each district needs to allow that capability to focus on that. Kristen, I love the fact that you were an assistant attorney general. So you probably see the world like I do of bad guys and good guys. <laughs> um, who are the villains? Who are, what, what are the stumbling blocks to actually getting a healthier education ecosystem? When you think about, I need to take, take down somebody, as you used to in your legal life. Who, who in the educational area do you think needs to be taken down who's stopping, you know, getting yeah. to a healthier place? So, so actually, when I first started at the Attorney General's office, my very first job was to go back and to reread all of the DeRalph decisions and determine if there was a way to force the legislature to respond. So the DeRalph decisions are the decision on the unconstitutionality yeah, so of the Yes, the DeRalph case. decisions are oh. these 20 year old cases that determine that the way that we fund our education system in the, in, in the state is unconstitutional because it creates so much inequity mm. in school districts. Um, and so, t you know, for me, I think that the, it's, it's really hard to identify who the white knights are in terms of, you know, those that are championing education because mm -hmm. we are so, um, we have so much hurdles to get through in terms of creating an equitable funding system. And without creating an equitable funding system, you're always going to see these disparities between school districts that are unfair and it's unrealistic to expect that the students that are attending these school districts that have so much less right. than some of our school districts that have so much more are going to end up on equal footing at the end of the day. Tessa Mitchell said, do you, do you folks do surveys of outcomes of, of students that come from different parts of the state and look at whether, I, I mentioned, you know, there was an Atlantic article that kind of poked holes in this notion that technology in schools automatically leads to better outcomes, that better resource schools ought to, so I'm interested in, in when it comes to outcomes and the performance of students over time, do you guys know what the secret sauce is of what works and what doesn't? Are you able to have those discussions? No, we have not had those discussions. Not at all? Not at all. So it's all just kind of faith-based decisions? <laughs> letting, uh, letting each district decide what the needs of their students are, yes. Interesting. Uh, but doesn't like data come into it at some point of looking at resources and outcomes? Might be a good idea. You know, it, it might be a good idea um, with as many school districts as we have to, to, to dr drill down into asking each school district exactly what they use, what programs they use. I mean, we have that type of information, but um, not so much as, as like invasively going into their classroom and, and asking them, okay, exactly how are you administering this program and, you know, what is your, we don't have that information. So well, let me ask you another way to look at a matrix. I've also interested in was looking at Ohio, which is a really much healthier, robust set of partnerships with schools. That you look at the corporate sector, and one of the big problems out in the country broadly are the, the jobs gap and the skills gap, and looking at where the private sector has come in and worked with schools, worked with high schools, worked with, uh, uh, I don't know what to call them, vocational schools, community schools, and others in this. Okay. And, and I'm wondering, is that, is that, do you think that's moving the needle in the right direction when it comes to both private partnerships and bringing technology in. Absolutely, I, I think allowing the corporate sector to come in and, and having those discussions is, is absolutely um, essential. You have some areas and pockets of the state, uh, Northwestern Ohio, for instance, that's very high in manufacturing. Um, they kind of um, would need a stronger base of coding and computer programming. Um, a lot of, they have a lot of factory mm -hmm. lines, which is robotics, or even designing their products, um, for instance, 
one of the manufacturers um, has a forklift and they now have a glove that the employee can wear that actually programs and mm. drives the forklift as they walk in front of the forklift to pick stuff off, off of the uh, shelves and stock the thing. So that, that's a, a different um, knowledge that those students would need going forward if they would want to get jobs in those communities where uh, up in you know other areas they're very high in manufacture or I'm sorry in uh, medical fields so they're not going to need as much as the uh, manufacturing coding type of skills mm -hmm. they're going to need more office space in, in, in different um, programs like that and too. I've been reading uh, if, if this is correctly attributed to you that, that you found that in these partnerships with both technologies that, that traditional schools surprisingly have had greater success than charter schools here so far. Is that right? I've seen a lot of traditional schools really embrace what the manufacturing communities need with technology and really tried to um, uh, form partnerships and bring those into the into the buildings. How's that happening in your, are you, are you, do you have charter schools in this area? Ooh, like we we're in your district, right? You're in charge in this area? Yeah. And you're in charge above, <laughs> right? So we're sort of in your world, the whole state, but we're in your district here locally, so. Yes, this, well, yes, this is my district. I should I'd never really say I'm in charge here, of anything. You, you, you get back on this. I can't do this. You guys sit on the couch. We're going to have like this kumbaya thing here by the time this is all over. So, so we're in your district, but in the, when it comes to partnerships and, and looking at these issues and, and, and charters, I don't want to go too much on the charters public school area, but, but do you see a difference, Kristen? Um, you know, I'm fortunate that the charter schools I have that are within my district are, are good, high-performing, quality charter schools. God, there's got to be one bad one, that, right? Uh, across the yeah. state, there's yeah. definitely more than one. Uh -huh. um, yeah. You know, un unfortunately, we have become, I think, a state that has cared more about the profiteering of education right. than preparing our students for pathways to success through our charter schools. Mm -hmm. And so um, I'm lucky that the ones I have are, are good ones, but I would say the vast majority, unfortunately, have given them a bad name. Um, in response to creating these public-private partnerships with uh, companies or employers in my district that are uh, looking to develop the workforce needs through mm -hmm. our education system, you know, we, we try to be open to that. We certainly want to help uh, create those avenues so that our graduates will have good paying career jobs. Um, but we, I think we also need to be conscientious about creating minimum standards that, you know, workforces change. Um, right. We can't solely be dependent on uh, the employers in our communities determining and dictating what our educational standards are because, mm -hmm. you know, they, they may not be here in 10, 15, 20 years. Um, so we need to develop our students so that um, they certainly are able to work good career jobs when they graduate, but that they will have opportunities to learn transferable skills as well. You know, when it, it, I guess I both of you, one of the things that has uh, bothered me about this topic for many years on digital divide, on how to get education right, is there's a certain set of questions that has to do with how fast technology is coming on. I've interviewed Sal Khan and Khan Academy, and you go to India, and you see all these students in India taking Sal Khan's courses long distance and getting themselves into universities in Canada or England or the United States. And it's remarkable to see that, that ecosystem evolve. And yet we're in states and sometimes we talk about the connectivity. So maybe we don't have fiber into communities or we don't have the resources and, and, and material. And we're a very rich country. Uh, on the other hand, there's a sort of conceptual connectivity that I'm just wondering about where we may have a generation of teachers or mentors or uh, parents that haven't conceptualized these opportunities in a way. So you can have broadband in and maybe still it's not valued in the way that a poor kid in India values it. And I'm interested in how you mesh those. So the one's physical infrastructure, the other's psychological and intellectual infrastructure that values this. And I'm just interested, Kristen, do you deal with that element uh, in, 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 in tests when you deal with the, on the, on the you know, state school board, do you guys wrestle with those conceptual issues of how do you get greater demand for this kind of thing? Does that make sense? Well, I think, they, I think the chord that you're striking is this idea that education is as much about learning skills and training as it is about a socialization process. Right. And if you don't adapt the idea that you have the opportunity to truly achieve success, through your education, then no amount of technology, training, instruction is going to bridge that gap. If you yourself don't believe that that's the pathway for you to be able mm -hmm. to 
go to college or lead a more successful life. And I think that, yeah, we do fall short in some of our communities and some of our school districts mm -hmm. of providing that socialization that right. you have the opportunity to be successful if you mm. take you know every chance you can at advancing yourself. Tess? Um, yeah, you know, th those are a lot of discussions that we have at, at the, the state board and the department level as well. Um, you know, as far as the infrastructure, looking at it, we're, we're going through again uh, the highway of infrastructure, making sure or seeing um, districts that uh, what they have available, or if they don't, what's what's out there and available to get it within the the, the classrooms, um, and then just trying to um, build different resources available um, to the districts to be able to figure out how to integrate all that. You know, the thing I read about you is that 100 percent of the students in New Knoxville graduate from high school. That's remarkable. That's is that a true stat? Yes, it is. 100 percent. We graduate How many of them are there? Like. 25 Seven or to eight. 30. <laughs> yeah, 25 to 30. Okay, so no, but 25 still. 25 to 30 Yeah, students. but I mean, that, that mean on one, good one year would be one would be 4%. Down. I mean, that's, I mean, I find that interesting that you have it. Now, I understand that one of the things you've done, because you have a largely homogenous population there, I guess it's 4%, which means you have one kid of color in the school, right? So, um, or maybe across, that's, I mean, if, you, if, my, if my data is correct here, we had intelligence it, it's done on both off, of you. It's a little off, but we'll go with it. Yeah, so, so but the, you've gone on a listening tour, basically, to kind of experience other school systems. Correct. What have you seen in the state that was great? What did you see that was lousy, that scared you? Um, the greatness is, is, is the uh, collaboration um, that districts have. Um, you know, I've been to some districts where, where not only were they um, collaborating with, with technology, um, with students within their own classroom, but they, they had two other states. So um, their classroom, along with two other classrooms across the country, um, all had to come up with entrepreneur uh, business plans, and they had to pitch them to one another via, um, uh, through the internet. And, and they had to critique one another, and they had to go back and tweak plans. And, and so they had to not only work, learn how to work with with their peers within their, their classroom that they see every day, but a whole different realm of, of different personalities. So they were connecting different to different communities. Yes. Did you see, have, have you seen, uh, uh, I mean, I hate to put it just bluntly, I put it bluntly but have, have you seen the dimensions and, and, and challenges and the, the opportunities of, of, of greater racial diversity inside schools? Because I know that some of the rural school districts are not that racially diverse, whereas the urban uh, schools are here. No, I haven't really seen. I mean, in the classrooms, is it, mm. it's everyone is 100% hands-on and, and, and involved in it that that, are, that is in that district. You know, one, one of the things, Chrissy, I've often thought about. I'm, how many of you are school teachers, just by any chance? Okay, I just want you all to know I'm good friends with Randy Weingarten because I'm going to change. You know, I've always wondered because there's this question about teachers, and 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 I've often thought about, um, and this is really bad. You know, with doctors. Doctors are challenged now. Lawyers are challenged now by apps, right? You can go to, you know, you by 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 you know applications. The information that is brought to us uh, through technology has allowed us to even out I information. Now maybe it's you know still uneven, but I've always wondered why education and the old model of teaching and students and whatever continues to be pretty resilient and 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 has not as been as disrupted as I might have thought by the high-tech area, killer apps, teaching online, all these kinds of rapid. Now, maybe I'm wrong and have, but, but I'm wondering, because one of the criticisms of education in the country is that if you have a great teacher in one place, you're going to do well. If you have a lousy teacher, a lousy you're going to do it. Why hasn't technology evened out the opportunities for all kids? Kristen? Because I don't think, uh, especially when you're talking about early childhood education and, and educating um, our younger students, I think that that human relationship is so valuable to the teaching aspect itself. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that, the, that those type of technologies um, can be very useful as, as students um, achieve higher grades. Right. Um, but certainly, you know, early on, you, and, and I think it's driven by parents too. You, you want the person that's accountable for your child's education to be someone that you know, that you trust, that you respect, right. that you can have a conversation with one-on-one, -on -one, that you can look in the eye. And I don't know that we're necessarily ready yet to accept this idea of especially our younger students being educated by people who are mm. perceived to be remote or not necessarily as available as some other. Now, I think there's an opportunity for that to change, um, but I, don't th I just don't think that we're there yet. 
Um, certainly, I think that the technology can be integrated um, as students are, are older and that they get to take more advanced classes or have different mm -hmm. types of opportunities. Right. Um, but that's why I think you haven't seen the disruption that you that you have in the medical field or the, the legal field uh, where people you know want to assert themselves into that process more because of the technology that or the information you can get online. Mm. Tess, your thoughts on that? Um, I, I think some of it is, is um, I would agree, you know, in, in the younger years, you don't really want that disruption of technology 100%. The, mm. Those students need more of that personal touch. But I see a lot um, and am seeing a lot more and more in the higher grades mm -hmm. of the teachers, absolutely. I think what you would term is disrupting the classroom and, and, and changing up their, their um, teaching styles um, using different tech forms of Google Classroom and, right. and, and different clips and, and um, giving students projects and letting them own the research instead of the teachers up there um, just um, lecturing the whole time. So I think it's, it's slow catching on. Um, partly, uh, my opinion is, is it's just um, the technology was there, but, but the professional mm -hmm. development didn't follow it. I do want to go to all of you in a minute, but I'm going to steal a couple more minutes because I'm going to say this. Is, is your budget big enough to do what you need to do? No. 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 Let me yeah. look to you. No. 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 Yeah. No. So is your, no, I mean, you know, so, so, so I as I understand it, <laughs> Governor, I mean, I may have this wrong, but Governor Kasich cut back a lot of what was going to the school districts, and, 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 but in the, in the most needy school districts, the most impoverished, I shouldn't call it impoverished, the, 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 the most resource-strapped school districts, he was able to up it a little bit. But it just raised this question. We were talking earlier about, you know, we, we ran a cover story once of, of the Atlantic called The Wired Child. Well, The Wired Child in Appalachian, Ohio, has to go to McDonald's at night to kind of finish their home, homework. And so it just raised the question, if you had more money, I mean, are you out there asking for more money, screaming for more money, and say, Every day. give us more money? Because, you know, and, and, and do you look at these hubs? Like, I, I, I have to tell you, just when Stu was saying this from Connect Ohio, he says, the problem is mathematics. And the problem is the cost of, of, of these areas. And so that's an area that you should be able to fix, right, Tess? I, if I had an open checkbook, absolutely. Yeah. Yes. So how much <laughs> would you like to ask the governor for? An open checkbook. There you go. <laughs> well, with that, let me go to the, the, uh, the audience here, right up here in the front. Thank you. That was a very tweetable moment, by the way, folks. Hi there. Go Angela ahead. Lopez with Columbus Women in Tech. Um, so I'm not an educator, but I know from a lot of teacher friends that mm -hmm. um, more expectations are always being put on teachers, and that is not just to teach kids, but you know, recognizing that they haven't had food or when we talk about special needs, right. um, being able to cover this large group of students with differing needs. How do you see technology being, I mean, you're talking about in person, right? Like the, mm. the personal touch. A teacher can't see that on video. You can't see that a kid hasn't bathed for a week on a video. <laughs> so how does technology enable us to be able to do some things, but then also, you know, we, we're still going to need that personal touch. So where's... Mm. Where's the Quick reaction happy test? medium? Um, I, I think that, that it should always be a blend. I, I, I don't champion technology being 100% in the classroom and not mm. having that personal touch because that personal touch is, is what I think drives you know, children's confidence and passion. Um, but allowing technology to come in and help, um, I, I'm a firm believer that, every, as I said earlier, every child learns differently. So uh, even around my kitchen table, there's sometimes where I have to bring technology in in, in Khan Academy right. um, to um, try to explain a certain um, subject or problem that I'm not um, delivering well to my to my child. He's not mm -hmm. understanding it. So I think technology can come in to those, especially special needs t students that just um, learn a different way. You, you can bring in different resources mm -hmm. and availability. I, I think in the ideal world, it's the teacher who should be the one to get to determine when to bring the technology in and how it's best used in the classroom. I mean, I think that we need to allow them as the professionals that they are to determine when the technology um, is a benefit add, uh, when it could be utilized to the, to the best good. Are and they getting enough training and enough exposure, enough professional development resources to do that? I'm going to say probably not, mm. um, but that's not based on any credible complaint that I've received. 
Um, I think that the teachers... She'll take complaints in the back <laughs> at the bar. Uh, <laughs> um, but I just I, wanted I, to open that door. What I, what I know about teachers yeah. is teachers always want... They, they're, they're educators and they always want to learn more. Right. And so I think as, as, a, as a group they would... Uh, want more training and, and want to have that opportunity to, to develop themselves professionally more. Yes, right back here. Um, hi, my name is Amy hi. Allen, and I'm a Columbus City School teacher. I teach the fourth grade, but I also um, integrate technology into my classroom. And Can um, I stop you there? How yeah. do you do it? What do you do? Okay, I teach language arts and social studies, so I do have um, a rotation for my centers. Um, I use one program, IXL, that I purchased um, with uh, some help through others for my classroom to, I'm also at an ESL school. So okay. I use the program to help differentiate um, the lessons for my students. Mm. Also, I have another center that is um, for reading, um, using Epic, different books um, for different students, some that read to them when I can't be with them at a guided reading table um, doing a lesson with them because I have um, several kids. So I try to make sure that they're reading the right things. I have a listening center um, that is social studies where they listen to the up-to-date social studies with Ohio, um, Ohio as America. Mm. And then um, my, my whole thing was is, um, for testing, for Ohio mm. testing, everything is online now. Um, I have a center where I try to focus um, on keyboarding skills. And where do you feel um, that that should come into play with keyboarding for testing? Because a lot of the testing is based on timing. You know, you're, you've got a certain amount of time. And if you are just packing or you aren't familiar with the keyboard, it really affects your scores as a mm -hmm. student. Thank you. I love this question, as I know you have been very focused on the, the, your concern about the online testing and having students have, have, have prepared for that. Yeah, I, I, I you know, online we, we need to uh, focus of what we're putting our students through because um, online testing, yes, I would agree, it's very hard and very challenging and I, and I question sometimes if at the younger age, I think the older students have a, a, a better grasp of it, but at the younger age, um, they're still, uh, when they're great at doing this, they're horrible at doing this. Um, so even in my house, so you know, it's it's really they're still trying to figure out how to type, and then we ask them to write paragraphs and, and things of that form, and, and they lose their focus on, on what they're truly concentrating on. So I think we need to take a, a good look at if that's truly allowing them to be successful and to display their accomplishments. I have the meanest teacher I had in high school was Miss Pinckney, and she was my typing instructor, and I thank God I had her uh, down today. We were talking a little bit earlier, just before I take the last question, that I, I want to ask, because you were just sort of saying, well, all the kids have this. But one of the challenges is whether there are uneven, un, is unevenness. And I was asking you if, if you had a disconnected, or, or not as connected to broadband, not as connected by experience and enthusiasm, uh, to the to the tech platforms that are out there, I ask you if your old community was was producing stunted students. Oh yeah. And the answer was. Uh, I, yeah, I mean you you can't ignore the disparity. The answer is yes. Yes, the answer is yeah. I mean you can't ignore the disparity in technology right. and the ability to be successful, you know, in college. And and I think I'm sharing with you the story of you know my best friend was our valedictorian. She was the smartest person I knew. Um, she went to college to become a doctor and she couldn't pass her freshman biology classes mm. because we didn't have the microscopes that mm. some of the other students in her class had in their high school labs. And, you know, so it, whether it's microscopes or whether it's broadband, I mean, mm. it doesn't matter. Whatever that next thing in technology is, right. when one ha someone has it and someone else doesn't have it, you're going to see those disparities in being able to be successful. We're going to have one last question right here. Hello. Uh, hi, I'm Chad Aldis with the Thomas B. Fordham Institute. So we heard a lot today, and I think it's consistent with conventional wisdom, but there's a school resource issue. So s there's some component of school funding at the heart of this. In Ohio, the average per pupil funding is around $12,000 per pupil, which would, mm. which would challenge, which, which would surprise a lot of people when you actually hear the amount. And in our high, higher needs districts, it's often fifteen, sixteen, or 17000 mm. per pupil. So if we do have a resource problem, if it's about the amount we're spending on schools, how much should we be spending? 
And if it's not a resource problem, uh, what should we be spending more efficiently, more effectively? Terrific. This would be a great way to wrap it up. So let me go to Tess first. Um, mm, um, every, every district, I, I don't... Um, I don't think that there's a certain set amount um, that we should spend. Every district's different. I know districts that are some of our highest achieving districts that only spend $9,000 or $10,000 per pupil. Um, so um, I don't know what a dollar amount is because what I guess I go back to what every district needs is, is very different. And so um, setting a certain dollar amount there might restrict some and um, not others. So. Um, I don't really know. What the but I think what is. it raises a question of is we need another conference to ask why is a performance in one area that's that's under resourced but overperforming, what's the secret sauce, right? Or what is the uh, impediment, or am I worried the the villains in black hats where you have a lot of resources and poor outcomes? You know, I mean, I don't mean to put it that bluntly, but I mean I just sort of think that that's partly uh, uh, the challenge. And I was asking the earlier panel, you know, who 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 needs to be shamed? Uh, somebody else basically said this gentleman up front. I think basically said not shame, but basically networked or something, or you know incentivized. But but Kristen, how would you answer this? Well, I think I think you get to the the crux of the issue here. That it is um, there is a funding issue. Um, it is resource. I don't have the answer of what the magic number is for that. But I don't think that anyone in the General Assembly has that magic answer either. And that's why when I said earlier, when I was asked what would I do to disrupt the system, I would advocate for exploring the possibility of taking funding out of the General Assembly's control and put it into a body that can have a strategic long-term plan to address those questions and solely be focused on those questions. Because right now in Ohio, healthcare and education are the most uh, the biggest line items in our budget. We spend a ton of money on education, but I don't think anyone should be satisfied overall with the results that everyone is achieving. Um, but we're not, we're not able and haven't been able for the last 20 years since we were told that our funding system is unconstitutional to address that in a meaningful way. So I, so I understand it, Kristen and Tess, this is the first time you two have met, right? Yes. Yeah, and you, you're both into education. You're both really smart in education, right? Because yes. <laughs> I, I, I think you guys ought to get together more often, right? And, and you know, so, so will you get together again? Sure. You can yeah, know each other. Absolutely. There, there we go. We, we've achieved one thing from today's there. forum. Yeah, Ladies and gentlemen, Tess Esloff, president of the Ohio State Board of Education, and Kristen Boggs, representative of the 18th District of Ohio. And that should be Elshoff, my apologies. So thank you both very much.